ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real-life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to The Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we have the first part of a three-part series with Matt Alderton from BX Networking. Now, Matt has got a really interesting story that he talks to us about over these next three episodes. It starts with his entree into business, operating and opening a Subway franchise. And then over the years from that very first Subway business, he bought, started, grew and exited six businesses along the way, resulting in a business that he ended up growing to a point where it raised $2.5 million in a capital raise and then ultimately sold for $16 million to a listed entity. Matt then went on to use all of this knowledge that he gained over the past 18 years of starting, buying, growing and selling six businesses to start BX Networking that he's now scaling for an ultimate sale or a continuation for investment into the future. So in this episode, which is part one of our three-part series, we talked all about Matt's early experiences in building small businesses, the Subway franchises, cafes and video stores. In part two of our two-part series, we then move on to discussing his experience with creating from ground up an online payroll rostering software that he ultimately sold for $16 million to a listed entity. And in part three, we talk about his current business and how he runs his current business that is now expanding internationally based on the learnings from his past acquisitions, growth and exits along the way. Well, without further ado, here we go with Matt and part one of this three-part series. Wonderful, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us on the Deal Room podcast. I am so excited to chat to you today. It's great to be here. Thanks, Joanna. Well, great to be here in Australia. I mean, I'm lucky to capture you. I mean, I guess virtually we could do this from anywhere. But you just seem to be constantly all around the world at the moment. Every time I look, you're in a different location worldwide. I, I was just saying to my wife this morning, I get off the plane at an airport and I'm like, which which terminal am I in? Which city am I in? Which direction am I going? <laughs> which I get country confused. am I in? <laughs> it gets pretty confusing. Yeah, I've just got back from the US last week uh, and I was over there for a couple of weeks with our US teams and US groups over there and in Austin and Texas and then uh, came back and spent a couple of days over in Perth in Western Australia, back for the weekend, off to Canberra next week. Brisbane, the Gold Coast, New Zealand. It's pretty crazy, but, uh, you know, when you've got so much growth happening across the place, you want to be there to support it and, and to, you know, flagship that growth, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And look, um, such a good story that we're digging into today. And of course, we've got a two-part series. And, and in the first series, we're going to talk about your background. So I want to hear about all of this experience you've had in buying, growing and exiting your businesses. And in the second part, I just, I want to talk about how all of that knowledge has impacted what you're doing right now because you have so many insights that I just think are so useful um, for our listeners. And, and we've got um, listeners who are buyers, who are sellers, who are b- growing their business and just learning about the concept of acquisition and building for exit, as well as business brokers, corporate advisors, accountants, a whole range of different people who are interested in some way or another in um the acquisition, growth or exit of a business. And the thing is, your story holds so much of interest for all of them, I think. So why don't we get stuck in? Um, Matt, why don't you give us just a quick summary of, we'll start with a high level overview of where you've been, your business journey, and then we're going to go backwards and dig into each in a little bit of detail. Sounds good. Um, It's interesting. I was only reflecting on this yesterday. I was in WA and 
Uh, someone was asking about kids and how long I've been in business and stuff. And so I thought, oh, well, how long have I been in business for? And I went, well, my first business was in 2004. Um, and that was that was 18 years ago. <laughs> so I was like, holy crap, I've been in business for 18 years. Uh, and so someone said, were you nine? I said, yes, yes, I was nine. Thank you very much. Because I know what you're all thinking, 21, <laughs> maybe 22. Thank you very much. But no, <laughs> I've been in business for 18 years. And my first business was a Subway restaurant. Um, that doesn't count a couple of little entrepreneurial things I had going on through high school and uni and all sorts of stuff that I did. But my first bricks and mortar business was a subway. Um, over so the next decade or so, I've uh, opened and ran and uh, built a number of subways, video stores, uh, cafes, uh, and so I was very retail and hospitality based. And that's I had a lot of uh, experience in that uh, being a GM for a company that owned forty retail shops uh, back in corporate land. Um, but then I was always looking for solutions in my business for how I could run uh, my businesses better. Uh, and so I was look, looking for solutions. And one of those solutions was a business that I had created that was created really off the back of just creating something for my own business. And that was a business called IWS, Integrated Workforce Solutions, which is a rostering and payroll business, which really integrated from a rostering point of view, team members rostering all the way through to creating uh, and, and importing into a payroll system. And I developed this in about 2005, 2006 for my own businesses. And uh, keep in mind, there was no Facebook back then. So you've got to think about what technology was available back then. There was nothing available to do this kind of thing. Uh, and so we created this and we built this uh, timesheet rostering payroll solution that uh, fitted together with the rostering uh, for retail businesses. And that, that took off. It grew really fast over a number of years and some exciting stuff happened there, which we'll sure we'll touch on shortly as well. Uh, and then obviously, uh, I, I just love working with and within the, the, the business and SME community. Uh, and uh, I've done a lot of training education through business. And another one of my businesses, um, which started back in 2015, was BX. And it originally started as a training and events organization for small business, helping business owners grow and scale their businesses to achieve success in their business and really grow and scale up and avoid the pitfalls that many of us make. Um, and let's face it, uh, the statistics are that only 4% of businesses will make it to about 10 years, 50% uh, failing in, in 12 months, 80% failing uh, in about five years, and only 4% being successful. And I thought, well, it's no point following the herd mentality, doing what everybody else is doing. What are the experts out there doing? What are the successful businesses out there doing to make them part of the 4%? And I tapped into that and created a training, pro training program around that. And that's where BX started uh, and then we morphed into this uh, networking arena because everybody just wanted to do more networking and grow their business and connect with more people. And, and, I've, and I realized that many business owners were, they loved their business and they loved being involved in the business, but it was a lonely game because you felt like you, you didn't connect to a lot of people because no one understood the challenges that you were facing and the, the, you know, the, the long hours. People understand that when they're not in business. And so being part of a community that understood that meant that you all of a sudden had a whole bunch of new friends and, and family uh, that could surround you and support you um, in the good times and bad. And that's what networking a lot of the times is. It's about that community. Um, that's where the networking side of BX uh, was created more from. Uh, but that's it, like a really quick summary of where I've come from. But 18 years, can you believe it? Yeah. Oh, 18. Do you know what? I, I think I set up my first company maybe 20. Actually, the other day I realised it was 21 years ago. So Wow. You must have been six or seven then. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. I was, I was. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's exactly how old I was. So uh, I love it. I just, Matt, I, I feel in you this entrepreneurial buzz. I love that entrepreneurial buzz. But I, I want to go back um, there's so many bits that I want to talk about, so many nuggets that you've already sort of shared with us. And in part two, I'd like to come back to this, you know, what makes the successful 4% that makes it through. But we'll leave that for part two. And if you're listening in to this one, you'll have to head over to part two to hear all about that. But um, in this episode, I, let's start with the subway businesses um, because subway businesses are quite a different type of business um, to where you ultimately ended up um, and to where you are now. But let's talk about 
um, what, what that was like, what you learnt, what did you do wrong, what did you learn, and um, and did you exit those businesses as well? Do you, you built them to an exit? Okay, let's talk about that. So, what what did you learn in that process? What do you think, looking back, you 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 know you could have done better? Well, it's funny. I I, I went into Subway because I I had that retail experience uh, working as the GM, and I, and I was different roles within the company as well. And what I loved is the people side of the business. So, you know, every business at the end of the day is a people business, but I love the service side of retail and um, being able to, you know, bring to, to life, you know, and, and you know, when people are after things, they want things, they need things, they're, they're excited about buying things. Uh, and um, I loved being able to deliver on that through the products and services that we had. Uh, and then when I looked at different businesses and I researched a whole bunch of different businesses to get involved in, I was working full time still when I first opened my first Subway restaurant. So I knew that I needed a business that was turnkey, that had great systems and processes that could run without me needing to be involved in the day-to-day operations of the business. Um, and I, a lot of the experience I had was in building systems and processes in businesses to create you know, operational success in those businesses. So I knew that I needed that when I came into my own businesses and Subway was the standout. Uh, It's the number one franchise around the world. There's more Subway restaurants than any other fast food chain globally. I knew that it had the runs on the board uh, to achieve what I needed to achieve. Uh, But my biggest lesson uh, came from, uh, which is stupid because, you know, I should have seen this coming, but I I bought the business, uh, well, actually opened the first one, but I I opened this business. I chose Subway because of the systems and processes that would allow me to run the business without me having to be in the business. But the one thing that I found the most challenging was using the systems. I thought I knew better all the time. <laughs> and so what I do is I go, oh, yeah, I get why they're doing that, but I think we should do it this way. And so I would <laughs> – so the typical entrepreneurial mindset, right, like trying to herd cats, entrepreneurs. So I was fighting always against doing things um, in this box format. And, um, and I realized that, hey – They've done this before. They've done it a few times, like for over 40,000 times, in fact. They know how to make this work. They probably know better than I do, even though I thought I knew better. And when I opened my first shop, I was in my 20s, right? So, I, 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 I you know, in your 20s, you think you know everything. Um, in your teens, um, you, you know, you basically, what, is, what do we say to my daughter? Ask a teenager because they know everything. Um, I, think, <laughs> um, I think I was a bit like that in my 20s as well, just, you know, gung-ho entrepreneurial 20-year-old who knew everything. And I came to blows with some way over it because they're like, no, Matt, you need to understand. And w- once I got that, um, I'm like, right. And that stuck with me for a long time. Um, and even BX now, like all these years later, 18 years later, when I build assistance in my business and people say to me, um, oh, I think I know a better way of doing it. I like, tell me, but remember, we've got uh, years of building this and multiple times of success backing up what's working. But hey, we want to hear your ideas. And and I guess that's a, that's a small snippet that Subway probably lacked is that, there was no going outside the box, whereas I think um, what we need to know as an entrepreneur is, hey, you've got to build your business on systems. You've got to have those systems, you know, bulletproof, but you need to listen to your people as well because the best ideas come from the people using the systems. Uh, and even though you've built it based on the success that you had, if you want to keep moving into the future, you've got to certainly have people challenging your thought processes as well. So you've got to be open to that feedback. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a, a good lesson to learn on multiple fronts. It certainly is. Absolutely it is. Um, and, and so I love that you came in to Subway with management experience but not business ownership experience at that point. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm hearing one of the, the things that you learnt along the way is the way that you thought was the best way to do it. Maybe wasn't necessarily this interesting thing with um, the, this concept between the systems that are set up versus the ideas that you had to move out of them. Um, and how long before you exited that business? What was what did that look like? So that was actually the second last business I sold. So the first business I uh, opened was the one I had the longest, uh, and so I had um, so I had four subways, had a couple of cafes, a couple of uh, different uh, video stores. Um, so in my retail, so I think it was, video stores. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so the last this is gold, right? The last shop that I sold was a video shop in two thousand and nineteen. Um, so Whoa, I'm pretty what? sure it was the last video store to be sold. Uh, so it's pretty crazy. Um, but so a number of different exits in those retail shops, and I'll talk about the retail specifically, um, is that 
Um, so some of them I bought um, from a operation that was already existing. So uh, what, one of the shops I, I actually bought as an operating entity. Uh, three of them I opened from scratch and built and sold. Um, and one of them I closed. So I made a decision. Uh, there was a shop that had a narrow bean uh, in Sydney. And the uh, it was a good shop. It, it ran along well. Uh, it was there was a video stop shop as part of it. Uh, they both ran you know good little shops, uh, but my rent uh, at the starting point was forty six thousand um, dollars for the whole site, which was great rent. Um, that went to sixty eight thousand dollars. It went to eighty six thousand dollars, and I'm like, well, now it's getting tight because it's basically doubled. Uh, and then my next rent review, because it was the, the whole review process was uh, it was pretty crappy lease actually, but um, then. You'll, my God, the amount of leases I've negotiated over the time as well. That's a whole other. I mean, that's a whole other podcast episode about lease negotiation. Jeez, um, we'll come back. To yeah, that. <laughs> part three, lease negotiation. Uh, trust me, that'll be a boring episode. But um, what I they then put the rent up to one hundred thirty four thousand dollars at that next market review, and I'm like. I can't do it. I cannot do it. Like it was already hard work at um, that 86. So I just went, you know what? There's actually a time to say, because I think we get so emotionally attached to a business. Um, and of course I was as well, but you have to make good decisions. And my account at the time said to me, you're not going to make any money, 134,000 bucks a year. You'll be paying wages, you'll be paying rent, you're paying you for your food, but you won't be paying yourself. Uh, and and that's a problem. And there's no point having a business. And you're never going to. And this is the challenge with retail. You can't double your sales in retail. You grow a few percent each year or whatever. Or from scratch, you might go. You know, you might make ten grand, and you might make twelve, and then fifteen. You might get to eighteen or twenty or something. But you're never going to go up to thirty and up to forty in a in a that t- that type of business because then you only got a certain marketplace that you're serving. And the problem with that is when your rent goes up too much you can't actually sustain it. And so I made the decision to close that business. And that was tough. Um, I was lucky we were able to sell a bunch of the, the fixtures and fittings and things like that and to get out pretty unscathed out of it. But i tell you what, closing a business is not fun. Um, but it was a, it's a smart decision to make when, you know, because it's going to send you broke going the other way. So you really want to make good decisions about what you're doing. Um, and because I wasn't all tied into one business, that probably made that a little bit easier as well. And a good accountant, good advice. Joanna, good legal advice. Good financial advice. Two most important people in your business are going to be those giving you that advice. And I've been hurt many times over by uh, crappy accountants and I've been hurt a few times over by crappy lawyers as well. So you've got to make sure you've got the right people uh, helping you make those decisions. And the accountant at the time was making the right call with that business. Goodness gracious, there's another podcast. Matt, we are going to be podcasting. (laughs) Uh, okay, so we, we've we got, and I, I just want to highlight what we've just talked about, the decision to exit a business by closing it. Um, because Hard decision to make, um, but I think it, it's really an example of the cutting off, off the disease before it, um, it you know, spreads. And, and that, you know, as business owners, sometimes we have to make hard calls and the hard calls can mean the difference between ultimate um, success um, and a, a really bumpy ride along the way. So good on you um, for taking that call, but it's just a reminder to our listeners as well. But but let's look at the other businesses. And you know, one of the one of the things that um, I completely subscribe to is this concept that failure is fabulous, but just fail fast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> fail fast, keep trying, keep trying different things. Of course you want success, but you cannot get there without a few failures Absolutely. along the way. And yeah. I tell you what, I do not know, I do not know any successful business owner that has not had a few failures along the way. I just do not know them. So, you know, um, happens. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got past it. We've learned our lessons from um, the business we had to exit and for future lease negotiations, which is coming up in another podcast <laughs> episode, some point in the future, um, because this is something, it's quite funny you bring up lease um, because we literally um, just ha- have recorded a podcast a few days ago talking about leases, so it's really quite topical. I'm sure it's not um, boring. I, no, <laughs> no like well, of course, no. That of course ours isn't. No, absolutely, absolutely. But um, actually, you've just um, finished a training session um, for business brokers on talking to them about leases and from buy side as well, because there's so many things to think about for leases. It's not just 
the lease that is relevant to you in your business, but if you're ultimately going to sell your business, the lease can be a really critical component oh, of how a buyer views it. In a retail business, uh, because your goodwill is tied up in the site, in the premises, you can't move you know, to another suburb uh, necessarily and keep all that goodwill, your customer flow. The lease is such a critical part. Um, and so in the subways and the, in the cafes, um, you know, you dominate in that area. You can't move. So there's a lot of equity bought, built into that lease. If you've got a lease that's running out, you're not going to be able to sell your business. If you've got, um, you know, silly conditions in there um, and um, demolition clauses and stuff like that, it can screw up a sale. It's phenomenal. Like you learn all this, you know, usually when you're trying to negotiate um, the sale of a business, when you're doing your due diligence with a, a new buyer, it's crazy. So you Knowing all this in advance of entering a lease is so crucial because in that bricks and mortar uh, business, it is you know it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars difference in a buying price um, and a selling price for you. Absolutely, I love it. And as you say, you either learn it on the ground, you know, um, from lessons as you're selling the business, or you learn it through the Deal Room podcast if you're educating yourself along the way. Which, uh, <laughs> of course, our listeners are right now. But it's so good. It's so good to have. Um, you know, we we can talk from a legal perspective about the issues that we see, and and uh, you know, you know, um, talk about cases and talk about um, how we're negotiating things at a particular time. But there's nothing as strong as someone coming in and actually talking about it from their own experience. So you know. Um, um, I didn't even know we were going to go there. But anyway, it's um, it's fascinating and really useful for you to be casting this reality of um, running a business um, in, in some of these things that we talk about from a more theoretical perspective sometimes. Okay, so going back to your experiences then, um, growing and exiting a business, um, these initial businesses, you said the Subway was one of the later ones for you to sell. What was the first business that you exited then? Oh, the first business that I sold was a, a subway. It was a subway. So I owned a subway at Cogra uh, and I uh, I bought it from, like I bought it as an existing entity and, and built it up and, and sold it uh, probably four years later, four or five years later. And, um, yeah, so pretty, subway restaurants, pretty formulaic sale process. Um, even the cafes, fairly similar process there as well. Um, usually engage a broker, the broker finds buyers for you, buyers um, then begin a negotiation um, period with that broker. Uh, and it's 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 quite a good process to go through because it actually helps you. What it taught me for the, with the first one is how is the due diligence process. Um, and I'd gone through it when I bought the shop um, and I realized I paid way too much when I bought the shop. My very first business that I bought, not open, like open from scratch, um, oh, no. Yeah, so, you know, my probably accountant at the time didn't really give me a great deal of advice around that. Um, but I sold it for more than I bought it for. So that's that also a good thing, right? And so made profit over the years and also um, was able to um, sell it for profit. So, you, you know, that's good in a way, but I, I would have made a lot more if I was a bit more of a hard-ass negotiator in the first instance. But <laughs> due diligence is that crucial element and, uh you know, when we often joke about it because you've sat on the other side of the fence to me. Uh, That's yeah. a, a later transaction. <laughs> a later transaction yeah, and um, we wouldn't go getting with you, my lawyer and I. Um, yeah. Yeah, so like, and the due diligence process really is, and, and your listeners would know all about this, but it, it certainly is the more no's you give or you can't substantiate information, the, the more the price drops, the price uh, gets discounted but if you've got all the things that they're asking for and you can go yep tick yep tick yep tick 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 then you're adding value to the business uh, and i've found that uh over the years that i've made sure that i've used that due diligence experience and that checklist almost as a way to add value not when i'm selling the business but while i'm running the business and that it, that makes all the world of difference uh, and so I know when you were negotiating with us and BX, it was like um, you just you couldn't get a no answer out of me. It was, I had answers for everything, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> you, you definitely seem ready to go, Matt. And, you know, that's a, I think these really are, you, you know, from a buyer's perspective, they, they it's so often that we deal with sellers and, and you will probably appreciate this having perhaps been one of these sellers right in the beginning, but so often that we deal with sellers who just don't fully understand 
that they're going to be required to pro- provide information because the buyers want to test that the value that they think is in the business is there, that the value will transfer, that there aren't risks in the business that they're going to be taken over. And they do this mm. through lifting the hood of the business, looking into the business through the information that you provide. But so many sellers just don't have that information readily at hand or if it's at hand, it's messy, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's it's got holes all over it. And, and the problem with that is buyers looking in will then immediately have red flags that are going off yeah. and, you know, it can slow down sales, put buyers off, reduce the price, you know, all of those sorts of things. So I, I don't know if you've felt this or at, or at the very least cause you a lot of pain. Definitely. You just have everything ready to go in your finance. Like a lot of business owners, they sell. I think this probably where is what it comes down to. Business owners sell past the point of being ready to sell. They should have sold a year ago um, or a period of time ago. And they, uh, I was only talking about this yesterday when I was doing presentation and I said, um, you know, who he loves their business and everyone put their hand up. And I said, guess what? I know you will love it now, but you won't love it forever. And the time to start thinking about selling it is not when you fall out of love with your business. It's actually now. So prepare yourself for sale all the way through running it so that when you go, you know, I've had enough it's actually a great time to sell because you've been preparing for sale for a long time. Whereas most people don't do that. What they do is they they love it and they like, I'm going to be in this forever. This is the best thing ever. I love what I do. And and entrepreneurs are like a bit like, you know, shiny object people. We, we see something, we go, oh, I like that. We chase, we chase the shiny object. Um, at some point in time when, when we're going to fall out of love with the business or we're going to lose our... Uh, we're going to fall in love with something else more and we're going to go and be distracted by that or just want to exit. And the problem is if you leave it to then to start to, you know, bump up the profit uh, and, and do all those various things that are going to add value to the business, then it's too late and it's yeah. going to take you years to sell it because it's going to take years to build that value into it. So the time to add value in your business is like now. Uh, you want to make sure you're driving profit and, and the value of building your systems and processes and having key people in place, um, all those key metrics to driving value. Um, you want to have those in place now and not when you're ready to sell. Love it. And um, what, what we'll talk about in um, our next uh, part two of this discussion really is how you have gone about implementing that idea now into your business. Well, that's it for this episode of the Deal Room Podcast. Don't forget to tune in to episode two, which is our next episode in this three-part series, where we talk all about Matt's experience with an online payroll rostering software business that he started from the ground up and ultimately ended up selling for $16 million to a listed entity. And in that episode, we also dig into a discussion on employees holding equity as a path to locking in employee retention and the lessons learned along the way when selling to a public company. And on that note, we look at what you need to be aware of when selling to a public company and the differences in selling to a public company versus a private buyer. And finally, we look at that very important question of how to correctly time your exit. Now, if you'd like more information about this topic, head over to our website at www.thedealroompodcast.com where you'll be able to download a transcript of this podcast episode if you'd like to read it in more detail. There, you will also be able to book in with our legal eagles at Aspect Legal if you would like to talk about how we can assist from a legal perspective in buying or selling a business. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed what you heard today. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to the Deal Room podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player to get notifications straight through to your phone whenever a new episode is out. We also love hearing feedback, so please leave us a review and rating if you're already one of our subscribers or even if you're listening to this podcast for the very first time. Well, thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oakey and the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. 
We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.